Welcome to another episode of our crusade against cosmic misconceptions. After demolishing 21 of your rock-solid certainties about the solar system, we're ready to shatter seven more. Some of these are so deeply ingrained, you'll struggle to believe the truth even as you read it. Our brains love simple, intuitive explanations, but the universe couldn't care less about our intuition. Get ready to discover that many things you know about the cosmos are completely, spectacularly, embarrassingly wrong. Meteorites are scorching hot when they land. We've all seen it in movies. A smoking meteorite crashes down, leaving a crater of molten rock, the ground sizzling, metal melting at its touch. This image is so iconic that when a meteorite punched through a New Jersey roof in 2007, the homeowners called the fire department fearing a blaze. They found the meteorite just sitting on the floor at room temperature. Seems impossible. We see meteors burning through the atmosphere creating fiery trails. How can they be cold when they land? The answer lies in atmospheric entry physics. When a meteoroid hits our atmosphere at cosmic speeds from 7 to 45 miles per second or 11 to 72 kilometers per second, friction generates extreme heat, thousands of degrees. But here's the trick. This heat only affects the outermost layer, which instantly vaporizes in a process called ablation. Ablation is actually an incredibly efficient cooling system. The burning outer layer carries away heat as it peels off, preventing it from penetrating inside. It's the same principle spacecraft heat shields use. Sacrifice the outside to protect the inside. But there's more. Space is cold. Damn cold. A meteoroid that's drifted through the solar system for millions of years has an internal temperature around minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 270 degrees Celsius. The atmospheric passage lasts mere seconds, too brief for heat to penetrate the rock's interior. Result? The outside burns while the core stays frozen. Once the meteorite slows below 2 miles per second or 3 kilometers per second, it stops burning and falls like any rock. During this final phase, lasting minutes, the cold upper atmosphere rapidly cools the surface. Many witnesses report finding meteorites covered in frost or even frozen in ice that formed around them. In 1955, an Alabama woman was struck by a meteorite that crashed through her roof. She got a nasty bruise, not burns. If it had been red hot, that would have been a very different story. All lunar craters are from impacts. Look at the moon through binoculars and you'll see hundreds of craters. It's obvious what caused them. Billions of years of asteroid bombardment. The moon has no atmosphere for protection, so every space rock leaves its permanent mark. Simple and logical. Too bad it's only partially true. Many lunar craters aren't impact craters at all, they're volcanic structures. The giant lunar Maria, those dark patches forming the moon's face, are actually enormous basins filled with basaltic lava. Yes, the moon had a very active volcanic past. Between 3 and 4 billion years ago, titanic eruptions poured out oceans of lava that filled pre-existing impact basins, creating what looks like huge scars, but are actually ancient seas of solidified lava. But wait, there's more. Crater chains exist. Perfectly aligned rows of craters looking like cosmic machine gun fire. For years, astronomers wondered what kind of asteroid could create such precise crater lines. The answer? No asteroid. They're collapsed lava tubes exactly like those in Hawaii or Iceland. There are also lunar domes, rounded hills with summit craters that are clearly extinct volcanoes. The rimai, cracks and channels, are often ancient lava channels or cooling fractures. Even some apparently normal craters show signs of volcanic modification with flat floors filled with lava. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter identified young volcanic deposits, only 100 million years old. When dinosaurs ruled Earth, the moon still had active volcanoes. Not bad for a world we consider geologically dead. Solar wind is actually wind. Solar wind, the name itself evokes cosmic breezes blowing through the solar system, perhaps moving comet tails like wind moves hair. Sounds almost poetic, the sun's breath caressing the planets. Completely, totally, categorically wrong. Solar wind has nothing to do with wind as we know it. There's no air, no moving gas molecules. 
there's something far more exotic and fascinating. Solar wind is a stream of charged particles, mainly protons and electrons, shot from the solar corona at intense speeds, 190 to 500 miles per second or 300 to 800 kilometers per second. It's not moving air, it's electrically charged supersonic plasma screaming through the void. But how dense is this wind? Prepare for disappointment about 5 to 10 particles per cubic centimeter near Earth. For comparison, the air you breathe contains 30 quintillion molecules per cubic centimeter. Solar wind is a million billion times thinner than air. Yet despite being incredibly tenuous, solar wind has spectacular effects. Those particles travel so fast that when they hit Earth's magnetic field, they create the aurora borealis. They push comet tails away from the sun. That's why comet tails don't follow their motion. They slowly erode atmospheres of planets without magnetic fields. If you could stand in space without a suit, don't, you wouldn't feel solar wind as a breeze. It's so thin the particles would pass through you causing cellular radiation damage, but zero physical sensation of wind. It's more like being bombarded by invisible rays than pushed by air current. NASA must account for solar wind when designing missions. Those charged particles can damage electrons, degrade solar panels, even push probes slightly off course. Solar sails exploit this push to travel the solar system. Satellites orbit beyond Earth's gravity Satellites stay up because they're high enough to be outside Earth's gravity. How often have you heard this? Makes sense. Climb high enough and escape gravity, right? That's why astronauts float in the space station. They're beyond the gravitational field. No, no, and no again. This is one of the most stubborn misconceptions. The counterintuitive truth, satellites are in permanent freefall toward Earth. On the ISS at 250 miles or 400 kilometers altitude, gravity is still 89% of what you feel on Earth's surface. If you built a 250-mile tower and stood on top, you'd weigh only slightly less than on the ground. You wouldn't float at all. So why do astronauts float? because they're falling. The ISS and everything in it are plummeting towards Earth. But here's the genius of orbit. They are also moving sideways, so fast, 17,150 miles per hour or 27,600 kilometers per hour, that as they fall, Earth curves away beneath them. Result, they keep falling but never hit the ground. It's like throwing a ball. It falls down while moving forward. Throw it hard enough and its falling curve matches Earth's curve. Congratulations, you've put the ball in orbit. You need 17,500 miles per hour or 28,000 kilometers per hour, so don't try this at home. Satellites don't float above gravity. They're trapped in a perpetual dance with it. If a satellite slowed even slightly, its orbit would decay and it would crash. In fact, even at 250 miles, there's still super thin atmosphere causing drag. The ISS loses about 1.2 miles or 2 kilometers of altitude monthly and must periodically fire thrusters to boost back up. Hey Curious Squad, before moving on, answering the question, be sure to subscribe to our channel clicking on the notification bell and leave us a thumbs up so you don't miss out on our daily videos. Probes travel in straight lines. In popular imagination, sending a probe to Mars is like shooting an arrow, aim, fire, and the probe zooms straight to the target. Simple geometry. Shortest distance between two points is a straight line. <laughs> no. Try sending a probe straight at a planet and you need more fuel than all Earth's oil reserves. Probes instead follow elaborate curved paths called transfer orbits. The most common is the Hohmann transfer orbit. The probe launches when Earth and destination planet are specifically positioned follows an elliptical orbit intercepting the planet on the Sun's opposite side. For Mars, this means traveling 9 months covering 300 million miles or 500 million kilometers to reach a planet only 50 million miles or 80 million kilometers away. But it's often more complex. To reach Mercury near the Sun, you paradoxically must first go outward. The messenger probe flew out to Venus, then made two Venus flybys, three Mercury flybys, orbiting the Sun 15 times over six years before entering Mercury orbit. Billions of kilometers to reach the planet closest to the Sun. Why this madness? 
Energy Changing orbits requires energy, and launching fuel into space costs a fortune. Each pound of fuel needs more fuel to lift it, which needs more fuel. Instead, probes use gravity assists. They pass planets that accelerate or decelerate them for free using gravity. Cassini reaching Saturn did Venus flyby, Earth flyby, another Venus flyby, Jupiter flyby. Four gravitational bounces to accumulate sufficient speed. Voyager 2 used a rare planetary alignment every 175 years to visit all gas giants in one mission, bouncing from one to another. Gas giants are gas all the way down. Jupiter is a gas giant, so it must be a giant gas ball, maybe denser at the center, but still gas. Like a super-compressed cosmic cloud, you could theoretically fly straight through, if you didn't mind dying. This belief is so wrong, it hurts. Jupiter and other giants have internal structures that defy our understanding of matter. Let's descend into Jovian hell. The first 600 miles or 1,000 kilometers are indeed gas, mainly hydrogen and helium. But going deeper, pressure increases monstrously. At 1,200 miles or 2,000 kilometers depth, pressure is a million times Earth's. Hydrogen gas becomes liquid, but not normal liquid a supercritical fluid with no distinction between liquid and gas. Keep descending. At 6,000 to 9,000 miles or 10,000 to 15,000 kilometers, something insane happens. Hydrogen becomes metallic. Pressure is so extreme, 3 million atmospheres, that electrons dash from protons creating a sea of liquid metallic hydrogen conducting electricity like copper. This exotic matter phase doesn't naturally exist on Earth we can create it for microseconds in labs. Liquid metallic hydrogen forms a layer 25,000 miles or 40,000 kilometers thick. This generates Jupiter's monstrous magnetic field, 20,000 times stronger than Earth's. It's a cosmic dynamo powered by the planet's rotation. And the center? A solid core of rock and exotic ices, 10 to 20 times Earth's mass at 36,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 20,000 degrees Celsius, and 45 million atmospheres pressure. Hotter than the sun's surface, denser than lead, under pressure that would shatter atoms themselves. No, you couldn't fly through Jupiter. You'd be crushed, vaporized, ionized, and your atoms would join the metallic hydrogen sea long before approaching the center. Gas giant is astronomy's most misleading name. Martian dust storms are devastating. The Martian, Mission to Mars, Total Recall, Hollywood loves Martian dust storms. Walls of dust miles high darkening the sky. Winds toppling rovers, sand penetrating everywhere destroying equipment. NASA itself speaks of global dust storms engulfing the entire planet. Andy Weir, author of The Martian, admitted it. The opening storm stranding Mark Watney on Mars is scientifically impossible. It's the only creative license he took because the truth would have ruined the plot. The truth? The atmosphere of Mars is so thin, 1% of Earth's pressure, that even 90 mile per hour or 150 km per hour winds have the force of a gentle Earth breeze. Dynamic pressure, the wind's push, goes with velocity squared but linearly with density. With 100 times less density, you need 10 times more wind for the same effect. A 60 mile per hour or 100 km per hour Martian wind exerts the same pressure as a 6 mile per hour or 10 km per hour Earth wind. It could knock over a flag, let alone flip a rover or rip off a satellite dish. Rover spirit and opportunity weathered months long dust storms without mechanical damage. So, why do Martian storms look so dramatic? They lift ultra fine dust particles of mere micrometers that stay suspended for weeks. The thin atmosphere can't lift actual sand, it's too heavy, only microscopic dust. This dust darkens the sky and covers solar panels, but can't mechanically damage anything. The real danger? Solar panel darkening and mechanism clogging with superfine dust. Opportunity died in 2018 after a global storm, not from wind damage but because dust-covered panels couldn't generate enough power. Martian dust is also electrostatically charged and incredibly fine, penetrates everywhere. But it's slow contamination, not violent destruction. An astronaut in a Martian storm would see the sky turn red-brown and visibly drop, 
but could walk normally without being pushed by wind. Disappointing for Hollywood, reassuring for future Martian colonists. Here we are at the end of our fourth journey through the cosmic lies we tell ourselves. And you know what's beautiful? Every time we bust a myth, reality reveals itself to be stranger and more fascinating than fiction. Cold meteorites like cosmic popsicles, dormant lunar volcanoes, solar winds that aren't winds, satellites in perpetual fall, ice on Mercury, probes dancing orbital waltzes, space without temperature, gas giants with metallic hearts and Martian storms gentle as caresses. The solar system keeps surprising us precisely because it doesn't behave as we'd expect. And that's the real magic of science. Every answer opens 10 new questions. Every demolished certainty reveals unexpected wonders. Okay guys, is there anything you don't understand about what we've told you? If so, let us know in the comments. And if you want to learn more about the solar system, check out the whole series we've dedicated to it.